s and I, this is a wish, but um, significant change as it relates to uh, the ability of public sector funding from the federal government, uh, specifically aimed at resiliency. There being some pool of funding that we feel like could provide that initial impetus to anchor some of these investments that then could attract the private sector and attract the philanthropy, but would be um, a bit of that uh, first mover. I want to thank Boston Harbor now for just convening this uh, really important conversation we've been having uh, uh, and for asking me to be involved in this last panel here. I was lucky enough to hear the two panels before us and uh, I've said to my panelists this is going to be a completely different panel than what you thought it was going to be based on what happened in the first two panels. Now, uh, to be serious, the uh, you know, the idea was that the first panel would be about climate resilience, sort of about the how, uh, or about the what, really, on climate resilience. And the second panel would be about open space, sort of about the what. And we, the wrap-up panel, would be about the how. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the how in the first two panels. It's sort of what struck me just listening <laughs> in to that was there's kind of an emerging consensus about the what. And Maybe not entirely, and we're going to explore this a little bit with the panel, but the really rich conversation is about the how. Uh, and we a lot of good questions raised in the first two panels. Um, our panelists, who I'm uh, going to tell you just a little bit more about than what's on the screen, are going to try to get a little bit beneath the surface of the how, uh, how to actually align parties and resources to make a great harbor for all, uh, which, is, which is what we're all here for. So, um, Sarah, you all know Sarah Meyerson, uh, the chief planner for the city of Boston, has been involved in a number of planning initiatives, Imagine Boston 2030 and Boston 2024. Also, you may not know, has a, a finance background before going to planning school and becoming a planner, which maybe will be relevant to some of the conversations we're going to have here today. Uh, Monika Bowman. Uh, is the content director at ULI, which is an organization of real estate developers, primarily sort of dedicated to best practices in real estate development. Monika kind of manages the content at ULI. She's also an elected school committee member in Cambridge, which gives her a perspective on some of the community engagement processes we've been talking about. Um, and Abby Goldenfarb is a developer. I didn't hear any groans. Not yet. Uh, a developer with Trinity Financial, really one of the city's leading uh, mixed income and affordable housing developers. Uh, and she's been involved in a waterfront project in uh, East Boston, we'll hear a little bit more about from her, called Boston East. And the surprising fact about Abby is that she says she would do it again. <laughs> Maybe do another waterfront project and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that. So. Let me start by kind of asking you each uh, just a little bit of a framing question about your perspective, uh, and we'll just do it in the same order here. Uh, Sarah, you just finished the Imagine Boston plan. Um, we all know Boston, Boston is having a moment. Our city is having a sort of a transformative moment. Uh, it's been doing some planning now. Uh, how big, how important was waterfront planning and the harbor to that planning effort? Um, well, I it feels like we finished Boston or Imagine Boston 2030 a while ago now, but I guess it was relatively recently uh, within the past year. But you know, waterfront was a key component of Imagine Boston 2030 and all of the planning that the city is doing right now. And I think it continues to be apparent in the overarching framework plans, Imagine Boston 2030, climate ready planning, as well as the more uh, discrete planning that we're doing now, uh, specifically focused on certain areas and, and district scale planning that's really diving in. Um, it, and we started with big, big vision and, and um, value statements that came out of the, the planning and the conversations with the community that were really focused on how we could create a waterfront for future generations which meant a lot of things. That means a resilient waterfront, um, that means a waterfront that's for all Bostonians, and that means a waterfront that has um, protections in place for strong stewardship going forward. I think we all recognize that our waterfront is one of our greatest assets as a city, and it's an opportunity for us to really um, nurture and, and respect something that's a key component of, of who we are as Bostonians, who we have been um, for, for centuries. And I think you know that's ultimately a balancing act as well of all of the different um, 
uses and um, at times competing interests that want to take place in the waterfront and striking the right balance and making sure that we're preserving that balance um, for the future. So let me ask you a follow-up question. So were you, was how broadly engaged, you did a lot of outreach for Imagine Boston 2030, right? You had uh, a, a, an extensive outreach strategy, including some non-traditional methods of, of outreach. So how large does that loom beyond the kind of established waterfront stakeholders? Uh, property owners along the waterfront, Advo uh, harbor advocates uh, like the people in the room. I mean, for did you hear about it as um, a kind of underused resource more broadly than that? Um, perhaps not as much as we would hope. Um, and I think that that it in many ways also informed us of how we wanted to think about the value statements and think about um, creating a waterfront for all. Uh, many of the stakeholders that you would expect, the, the nonprofit community, the, the advocates around the harbor, uh, were very vocal throughout the process, as well as those who are property owners and those who are in communities that directly abut the water. But there are many uh, uh, folks in Boston who don't necessarily view themselves as living in a waterfront city. And that that alone was one of the key um, driving forces uh, that helped frame the whole um, featuring of the harbor in the planning process. We wanted to make sure that children who were growing up in Mattapan or in West Wa Roxbury viewed themselves as being part of a waterfront city in the same way that um, someone growing up in East Boston or the North End may view themselves as a waterfront city. Yeah. So, uh, Monika, over to you. Uh, ULI, the Urban Land Institute, has been pretty active uh, on climate resilience in particular, waterfront development as well. So what's driving that? Are your members driving that? Does that come, is that top down or bottom up? Or what's, what's causing that increased emphasis, would you say? And I'm going to ask you a follow-up question, or I'll just ask it right now, about how successful you think that's been uh, in, in uh, sort of uh, enriching the conversation. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. So for those of you that may not know a lot about the Urban Land Institute, we are a global nonprofit that focuses on the responsible use of land and the development of that land. And most of our members are from the private sector. Um, so we have a lot of engineers, architects, planners, finance, insurance. So anyone that touches land use, they're members of our organization. And, we, and I see a couple of our members here today. Um, I think sometimes what's really interesting for me is that whenever we have these conversations, conversations, they happen in silos. And the assumption is, is that the private sector um, isn't invested, um, maybe doesn't care as much um, in some of these issues. And I think the good thing about the Urban Land Institute is a respected and trusted organization where the private sector comes together to have these conversations. So we are member driven and I work in partnership with our members to bring forth what they think is important as it relates to the urban environment. And resiliency was a key part of that. And so the private sector really wants to be a part of this conversation. They want to figure out what are the solutions. And it's interesting um, today that the, the report came out regarding the harbor wall. Um, if you go back a couple of years, um, ULI released a report. It was living with the implications of water. And within that report was something very similar that was recommended <laughs> today in the report that we need to start thinking about what are some alternative strategies as it relates to being being able to make our city more resilient, particularly in the context of building on the waterfront. So um, I would just say that when we think about partnering, when we think about public-private partnership, that I think that there's an opportunity for growth as it relates to how we engage the private sector. Good, thanks. Uh, Abby, you've uh, been involved in Boston East in particular, a waterfront project, uh, mixed income project in East Boston. Tell us a little bit about what's, and as well as other non-waterfront projects, tell us a little bit about what's different uh, in a waterfront project, uh, some of the unique challenges that you face as a developer uh, in, in making the project successful. Sure. Um, you know, at first when you have a waterfront parcel, you think there aren't many challenges to have because the views are so incredible that the property will just sell itself. Um, and, and it does, you know, anyone goes to the waterfront, they can be captivated by the views and, and it's a really wonderful experience to go there. The challenges are growing daily. 
um, as you um, start off with permitting. The challenge is permitting a waterfront project, at least in the city of Boston, it took us over seven years to permit it. Um, the challenges go on to construction and, and how you're gonna um, how you're going to build the building, what type of underground system you're going to have, um, where you design the mechanical systems, um, all of the different layers that add costs onto a project. Um, it then goes to convincing your lenders that the 100 year flood is only going to happen once in 100 years and it's not going to be the next 100 years. Um, that we Luckily, we managed to um, convince our lender that before this past winter, winter when we saw you know, the 100 year flood came every other week. Um, and then you go to insurance and how you're going to insure it. So every, around um, every corner, you're facing a challenge. And, and obviously with the, the awareness that's been brought to climate change, um, those are questions we are now thinking about when you have an asset and you think, okay, how are we going to sell it? Or what is the next buyer? Um, thinking when they come to purchase it. So in the life cycle of a development deal, you are hitting challenges along every um, corner. Have you observed what Monika said a minute ago, that uh, the development community is increasingly uh, alert to not just the challenges on their own site, but sort of want to be part of a larger solution? Have you, uh, have you observed that? Do you think about this mostly on the level of your site and your project? Uh, how do you and and if you think beyond that, how do you how do you justify, um, y you know, uh, getting involved uh, in 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 broader efforts that go beyond the confines of your site? You have lenders and investors to answer to. Uh, how do you do that? I think it's. I think you have to really be committed to working with the city and the state. I mean, every developer, when they do a project, has to do some type of public benefits and offsite mitigation. And you have to buy into this idea that this is, you know, you need a neighborhood to make a building successful and to make a community successful. Our company, we're very committed to making community developments and making na transforming neighborhoods and being part of an overall healthy neighborhood. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what's driving a lot of these deals are financial performance and, and while you can do a lot of public benefits, which we've done in all of our projects, you, they can only go so far. I mean, you have to take it, you have to keep the finances in mind right. and it gets right. difficult. So let me ask each of you, uh, you know, but my premise at the opening here was that we sort of have an emerging consensus about the what. I want to test that with each of you. You know, we clearly don't uh, yet about a harbor barrier from the report we heard today. It looks like there really isn't a consensus about the outer harbor barrier, at least. But um, certainly with climate resilience, the more district level protections, we kind of know we need to do them. Uh, um, creating more waterfront open space and ways for that open space to be a resource not just for people nearby but for the whole city we know we need to do that uh, but you know I'm, I'm that I'm kind of that's the premise for the rest of this conversation so I want to test that premise with each of you what are the unresolved issues the sort of significant unresolved issues about the what before we pivot to the how I mean I think for from the city's perspective the the big components of the what are things that we feel like Imagine Boston and the, and the process that we went through around value statements, we feel like there is some consensus around that, around a waterfront for all, around um, creating networks that connect open space around the city to the water so that it feels like it is something that is a, truly a resource for, for all Bostonians. And, I, and we are doubling down and focused on district scale planning right now so that we are coming up with solutions that move beyond just building level protections, which I think we have established a, a relatively good leadership from a city perspective in terms of the guidelines and our expectations for building level protections. Now moving that to the district scale uh, that we think is key to protecting neighborhoods. You know, I, I think from really in a lot of ways the the intersection of the of the how and the what is where I think there's still some question in terms of the funding and how exactly that should be structured and, and who is responsible, who needs to come to the table and what the levels of expectations are from the public and private sector. Um, and, and that it, that intersects often with the how. Um, and and I, for us, that's where I still think that there is not true consensus all around the table. 
consensus about how to pay for it? Consensus around how to pay for it and whose responsibility is it to right. be in, in the driving seat. Yeah. The other the so other component of this too, I think, is order of magnitude. What does open space on the waterfront mean? How how big is that? And and what what does it mean to have a um, to have the uh, intersection of the built environment and that open space on the waterfront and, and what's the right balance between the two and I think that that's still you know those are order of magnitude on the margin areas where we can still have that conversation and where there may not be consensus and there may be differing perspectives from the advocacy community the public sector and the private sector and how about can you do both uh, climate resilience and open space is there are you know talking about how to pay for it can we I don't mean physically can you accommodate both but can you do both? Can you marshal the political, re the political will and the resources? This is really a question for all of you. Is it realistic to think you can do both? I'm, I'm an optimistic, so I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I say yes, but I think that we maybe... We have to end the panel if you said no, I think we'd all have to go home, so... I, I think we need to possibly reframe it. I, and, I, and I get this because I live in this, you know, I live across the river. And sometimes we don't think about, you know, the city of Boston in the context of all the people that maybe come in and out of it. And it, it goes back to the what and who will then be accessing it. And, and what does it mean to be able to galvanize not just the city of Boston, but all the individuals that interact with that land in some shape, form, or fashion to be invested in it. And so if we start thinking about it from that perspective, maybe the burden is not necessarily just on municipal resources. Maybe we need to think about, you know, what would it look like? You know, regional governance is not a big thing here, but, you know, wh what would it look like for us to explore, you know, how do we interact with other municipalities that then benefit from this space or the state? And God forbid if I say anything about the federal level, because not too much progress is there in the current um, in the current administration. But as we think ahead, because we're not going to solve these issues in the next two or three years, but how do we think ahead as it relates to how do we finance a vision that we want to have, not just specifically for residents of Boston or even just people that live in the seaport or the Back Bay area? We're talking about how can someone in yeah. Roxbury right. feel attached to the water as much as someone that sees it every day. I live in Cambridge and honestly I forget sometimes. I'm like, oh, I do live on, you know, a coastline because it just it's it's not something that I think about. But how do you change that? How do you make sure that people see that this is something that I can be um, invested in as well? And of course those two are related, marshalling the resources, right? I mean, uh, is David Levy still here? Uh, uh, David was here earlier, did a report, uh, UMass Boston, uh, uh, report on financing climate resilience that lists a number of me possible financing sources for climate resilience, really just climate resilience, not open space. And, you know, one fundamental question he raises that the report raises is how broadly do you spread that cost? Is there, uh, is there a carbon tax? Uh, then everybody who, in a sense, is contributing to the problem is paying for the solution, but you're spreading it very broadly to do that down to the very narrow value capture of you create the district that is served by the f climate resilience. So free associate a little bit, each of you, on where yeah. we ought to be on that <laughs> spectrum. Or is it all of the above? We need to do a little bit of all of it. So for many years in East Boston, we were faced with the challenge of um, not being able to build. We first started our permitting, and we hit the Great Recession and, and just couldn't make the numbers work and couldn't find an investor. So uh, Jamie Fay from Fort Point Associates convened a group of um, East Boston developers. And basically, the group would all get together about once every four to six months and, and basically commiserate and kind of complain and, and kind of come up with ideas about how we were going to get our projects financed. This was, I can't even, it was the saddest group, but <laughs> <laughs> now if we were just all like complaining it about right this. In the end, though, yeah, huh? we're all okay right now. But um, we're he's trying to reconvene another um, happier occasion but we would we came up with you know district improvement financing and we we talked to you Matt I think about what had been done or what we could do um, and at the end of the day it really you know luckily a lot of us benefited from the city and the state working together to help find ways to 
provide some uh, source of financing and some relief for all of these public improvements. I mean, if you go to the middle, you know, a green field in a suburban location, you may not be hit with having to raise your, um, you know, your ground level for feet, having to build a harbor walk. There are all of these additional costs that precluded the development from happening because we had to do them. We're, it was great that we did them in the end, but we, the public-private partnership was critical to making that successful. So others have, uh, early, earlier panel mentioned, you know, the harbor cleanup. Part of why we can have this conversation now about the harbor as a recreational resource is that we invested, is it $4 billion, $4.5 billion? And guess what? Our water rates went up, right? Uh, you know, we water rates are 10 times what they were. Part of that's inflation, but they're, you know, your water and sewer bill is 10 times what it was in 1982 when the when the lawsuit was brought. Should we should water and sewer be charging resilience fees? I'm looking at you, Sarah. I know this is not your decision. <laughs> you know, should the should should the MWRA start assessing resilience fees and accruing a fund to pay for harbor protection? <laughs> you know, it's not all one fell swoop. You, you know, they, they, right? They raise a little bit. Another earlier panel mentioned uh, the utility, the infrastructure providers that are fee based, who also benefit from having their infrastructure protected, whether it's the T uh, or private, you, you know, private utilities. Should they start? Assessing a, a, a resilience I mean, surcharge. That would have been great. I think we had to pay 1.6 million dollars for new sewer line. I mean, the, there are projects that can support that that can support it up to a certain point. So I think it's the idea of setting. You know, we're going to set a goal for the next five years about what we want to do or the next 10 years and see how we can make that work. But can't keep moving. Sure, the is the city thinking? You know, this other point that was made is we're not we're, we're the skies are not going to open from Washington, and you know, right now the only money that comes from Washington is FEMA money after the after the storms hit. Uh, so it's not likely in the near future that that's going to be a source. The Hopefully city's not. taken, pardon? <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> well, uh, you know, the city's taking the lead on the planning piece. Is the city starting to think about? let's call it financial planning, about the next piece of that, of how to finance this? We are, um, and I, you know, we, we recognize that we can do all of the district scale planning that we want, but unless we talk about the feasibility of it and really get to brass tacks on what are the financing possibilities, um, then we aren't, we aren't making it implementable yet. Um, and I think that one of the key elements of all of this is that Public-private partnerships are important, but we, we recognize that private development can't pay for all of what we need to achieve along our waterfront as it relates to resiliency and the creation of open space. There just isn't enough value shared to be had to fully rely on that as a tool to pay for everything. Um, it certainly is an important component of it, and I think that the, you know we can speak to where it's been successful in, in East Boston and other parts of the city, but it can't certainly pay for all of this. And so um, I, I don't know what the right solution is yet, but it is something that we are exploring in terms of how d what are all of the financing tools out there. Um, and we have actually um, proceeded forward with an additional study, particularly in East Boston right now, where we've done the district scale planning. Now we have a financing study that we're working on to really get uh, much more analytical um, into what could be the possibilities to realize some of the bolder visions um, as opposed to some of the nearer term um, uh, High impact, but more implementable um, things that we've been able to start to implement, be it on the on the greenway and other places. I, I would add to that. What I hear you, the question that you're posing, is a is a higher level question in my head. It's really about will do people, citizens, have the appetite to be able to finance what we need in this city? And so, in the context of this conversation, it is talking about you know the harbor and you know how we want to make sure that that is a public good um, for the city of Boston as well as beyond. And so, you know, how do you have a conversation with um, you know? I'll put my political hat on here. At, you know, as an elected official, you know, it's a very dicey conversation to have. Like, I want to raise your rates um, on X, Y, and Z. But I think 
is really paramount, particularly in the context of the environment that we find ourselves in, we need to figure out how to finance things. And so how do you have a responsible conversation with the citizenry of a community to say, this is what we need, let's have a conversation together to figure out how do we achieve a shared goal. And I think that's missing in the public sphere right now um, because we're just, there's a lot of things impacting how we have conversations in the public sphere. I'll just leave it that way. And I think to take that a step further, there's another element of that conversation that move, moves it beyond one municipality into thinking about, you know, how do we think about this in a regional way? And is this, um, if you were to think about our waterfront and all of the elements of it as an asset and a resource, it's an asset and a resource to the Boston metro area. It's an asset and a resource to the entire region. And protecting Boston is also key as being an economic engine and hub for all of New England. And so how do you have that conversation also in a broader way where there might not even be established venues or ways to have that conversation right now? Um, and I think that it, you know it's, it's critical to start to have that. So I guess you have another plan in your future. I don't know if it's another plan or a conversation, well, um, but so certainly a conversation. Yeah. So Let's let's get even one step wonkier here, if we can, <laughs> um, uh, to talk about uh, regulatory strategies. We talk a little bit about financing and needing to explore a number of different options, and particularly needing to broaden the conversation about the uh, about the value of investing in the harbor uh, before we start having the conversation about how to finance it if you want to have a successful outcome there. Uh, so, how about you know, we have some regulatory tools in place. Uh, we have a very strong uh, state waterfront protection, Chapter 91. It's been mentioned a couple of times earlier, a, st uh, a state waterfront protection uh, 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 statute and program that has, uh, you know, colonial antecedents. It's been around since the formation of, uh, uh, of the city, really. Um, and we have a municipal harbor planning process that is uh, sort of the, the, the first cousin of Chapter 91. Are they, which, you know, provide tools, as Abby knows quite well, uh, tools for addressing issues site by site. Certainly Chapter 91 does. It um, has kind of formula-based uh, requirements that you have to satisfy in any individual site. It doesn't explicitly address climate resilience, right? The modern program dates from 1983. Uh, the regs were what, 1990? Uh, pardon? Yeah, right. <laughs> Al, you were involved. Uh, so you know, people were maybe thinking about that. Where were you, Al? What were you thinking about? Why wasn't climate resilience in those? None of us knew there was such a thing. There you go. That's my point. So, and they've never really been. You know, it shows up in. Uh, 91 decisions in harbor planning, but it's n not in any sort of formal way. Is it? Is it time to start thinking about that? Well, it's part of the Article 37. I mean, it's when you go through Article 80, you have to respond to the Article 37 um, sustainability requirements, and but it's not part of Chapter 91. But I think it would be great if it could be part of it, and Chapter 91 could be revamped and more efficient than. And how about Chapter 91 instead of requiring public benefits site by site? So, for instance, Chapter 91 is a 50% open space requirement. So everybody satisfies that on their site. What if you had a harbor planning process that said, here's the best place for open space on this stretch of the harbor. And every development that comes along does their pro rata share of that signature open space where it's going to have the most benefit, having a, you know, through the harbor planning process, trying to think a little bigger about how to accomplish those public purposes. I mean, I think certainly from, from our perspective now, as we are starting to embark on um, you know, MHPs that we've done and future MHPs, I think that's the benefit of, of planning, is to think about how you can coordinate this and how that is coordinated across an entire district. And that's really the essence of the district scale planning that we're working on across the harbor. And I, I would imagine that many of those lead to updates of municipal harbor plans. Um, and I, I do think that that element of it is key because um, in certain places there's going to be uh, critical moments in time for interventions that are going to be um, 
the most important for protecting uh, the district as a whole, and we want to make sure that we can direct resources to those um, those highest bang for your buck type interventions, and and make sure that we are creating a system and a network that is is key. What you lose if you're just doing it parcel by parcel, and and it's it's hard to do in an established built environment because. It, Parcel by parcel planning is what ends up happening because you don't have just the green field to, to play with. Um, but we do want to make sure that we're working towards systems that work and towards networks. And I think um, throughout uh, Climate Ready Boston and Imagine Boston, we talk a lot about systems and networks and that being key to creating the right open space um, experiences on the waterfront and to maximizing the it as a resource and to also uh, working towards resiliency. The other piece of the regulation that I think so that would be so after the after the last of the climate ready Boston plans is done you've you've done two one underway and then a the, a fourth one for the inner harbor and then you would sort of circle back to yeah and and I think and, yeah. and future ones as well uh, we certainly still need to also look at the um, at the, the Charles River itself mm -hmm. um, and then also look uh, all along the Dorchester. Um, shoreline which has not been considered yet but it is key and, and critically important as well um, and so those are future district scale plans and then I think you you look at all of that and figure out you know how do we how do we think about this planning the other element of the regulation though that I do think is important is that in some situations we may have to think about um, moving forward with interventions that we haven't done in the past be that um, filling in certain ways in the harbor um, and that has its own host of regulatory challenges and a layering of regulation at both the uh, state and federal level that is difficult to navigate now and how do you um, tackle that or revamp that to make that work in an era where we're all trying to move forward with a different goal as it relates to resiliency. Yeah, interesting. I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up. We'll see whether we get questions from the audience about that uh, concept, whether that's in our future. Uh, and you've talked about a zoning overlay as well, a, a flood resilience zoning overlay district. Is that likely to move forward in any, uh, what sort of time frame do you envision for that? I think it, it is likely to move forward. Um, we are working towards a, a variety of different um, elements of the implementation of Climate Ready, but that certainly is an area that we've um, highlighted as uh, an area for, f for um, continued work and assembling the right working group to talk about what does that zoning overlay look like. Uh, the real challenge, I think, in the zoning overlay is making sure that we structure it in the right way where it is uh, properly incentivizing outcomes for both new built environment but as well as the existing built environment. And so how does this work um, at, with certain triggers as we think about buildings moving forward with substantial rehab or other um, modifications? Because much of our waterfront is where there is built uh, a building and much of the area where that we're in um, flood zones is already built and established. We're not just talking about new buildings here. And right. the, the I think new buildings were working, the process is working pretty well with, with, um, with you know, going through the, um, going through the process with the BPDA and the climate preparedness checklist, but that doesn't capture the established built environment. Right. So how do we think about that? I, the one other layer that I would add to this conversation when we think about chapter 91 and you think about, you know, what has been developed on the waterfront, um, how do you think about policies in the context of the multiple demands and influences and pressures that's taken place on a city. And so you think back, you know, a couple of years, nobody was thinking about climate resiliency as an issue that you needed to solve for. But how do you have a conversation knowing that we have a serious housing affordability crisis taking place right now? And I, and I think that is really important as you have these kind of these policy conversations, there has to be a level of integration as it relates to how the policies will impact or um, make worse or make better um, some of these other situations or uh, struggles that a, a region is having as it relates to accessing um, the, the, the harbor area. Um, because right now, what we're getting based on what we have, we have a lot of luxury condos going in. And I understand why that's the case, because it's an issue of numbers and making a project work. So, you know, this is not to, you know, demonize developers in any way. Um, however, I do think that if we're going to have conversations around changing a policy, it needs to be a broader context. So we'll make sure that we're, if we say it's going to be for all, then we're going to develop parcels of land or retrofit pieces of land that everyone will feel a sense of welcome or at least have the ability to access. Right. So what do you think the development community is looking for in order to be a constructive participant in this conversation, uh, right? This is you know we so 
two facts that kind of go on up, or two observations you both made that go in slightly different directions. You know, the first is, um, uh, uh, you know, you uh, we in a way rely on private development to a large degree to produce these public benefits. It's certainly part of the equation. Uh, it's true in Chapter 91, and it's true generally that we rely on private initiative, let's say, broadly speaking, uh, for public benefits in other realms in addition to improving the waterfront. Uh, so in a way, everybody is invested in development feasibility because everybody benefits from it. Um, on the other hand, if you load too much of a burden onto it, you sort of stop the train uh, or at least slow it down. Uh, so. Would de and yet, and I think you, you've all said that you share the sense, which, by the way, I do too, from uh, from you know my work with developers, that developers want to be constructive participants in the conversation. It's maybe enlightened self-interest. It's that they it may not necessarily be pure civic virtue, but it doesn't matter really. Uh, they want to be part of the solution uh, if they can see that there's a solution they can be be part of. So. What do developers want to see happening in order for them to kind of step up to do more than they're doing site by site? I think um, for developers of sites that they are they own or that are you know vacant you know open space, um, having a finite set of principles and things that they can work towards is important. And not having the conversation. The longer we were involved in a Chapter Ninety One permit, the more public benefits got laid onto it, which it was a vicious cycle of more public benefits and then it was the numbers kept not working and we needed some state and city support. Um, so a finite set of kind of this is what you're gonna add to your project and this is what you're gonna have to do and when you're done committing to this, you'll get your permits and you can go forward and build it. I think there are a lot of sites right now on the East Boston waterfront, for example, that are that are burdened by um, antiquated potential, you know, zoning, and uh, that may respond better if there was a carrot out there of, you know, we could give you some relief on the zoning if you were to create these public benefits. So a give and take, I think, is important to have um, in any conversation, and and that's important. What? I ask one last question in this in this um, sort of theme. And that's about the role of philanthropy. We've heard in previous panels that um, there is philanthropic interest uh, in the waterfront, certainly, uh, uh, particularly from the Barr Foundation, uh, has been uh, made it a major focus of their giving. Um, fundraising in general for the benefit of the harbor as a resource for all is, or, or philanthropy is an increasing source of funding, a kind of third source of funding. Does that, does philanthropy coming to the table, um, how do each of you view that from the perspective of, does it make it easier for the city to make the case for spending resources when philanthropy is stepping up? Does it make it easier to make the case to developers that they should be doing it when uh, philanthropy is part of this conversation? I mean, I think there, there's three legs of the stool as it relates to there being public funding, the philanthropy and the, and the private sector funding. and. All of those coming to the table at once is key. Um, I think that the philanthropy can be very powerful in um, in anchoring investment in one area and then attracting um, the public sector funding that might, might feel like we don't have enough to complete it, but when we are able to combine that with philanthropy, we get that much closer. And then, then the conversations with the private sector as well where you're able to piece that together or club that um, across a range of private players, be them um, tenants or property owners along the waterfront who can um, also come together and feel like maybe individually they wouldn't be able to um, make some of these you know larger price tag item items come to fruition, but when you combine it is, is the key. And I think all of those players are more likely to come to the table if they feel like they're going to actually see implementation. Right, right. that they're all part of a larger plan. Exactly. Yeah. I see philanthropy as um, the neutralizer <laughs> in the conversation um, because I get the the negotiation that takes place between um, you know the developer um, and the city and the reality is sometimes you have to push on the development community in order to get 
you know, what you need on the other side of the river. You know, we increase um, different contexts, but we increase our affordable housing requirement. And people are like, oh, we're not going to develop there. There's still plenty of development taking place in the city of Cambridge. <laughs> so I think that, you know, it's just the nature of the beast if we operate in a capitalistic society. And what happens is the public sector and the private sector get caught up in that dynamic because that's how they function or that's how we have functioned historically in the context of um, permitting um, in, in this area. But I think that philanthropy, philanthropy can help kind of break that. It, it breaks little, it up yeah, a little yeah. bit and it, it allows us to have a, it, it pushes us to have a different type of conversation. Um, I was in philanthropy for a while and I would only push on this as it relates to philanthropy. I think that, you know, the people in philanthropy I think as it relates to diversity of perspective and voice, I think they too need to get pushed because, I mean, you know, all we have to do is look around this room and see who's here and who's having these conversations. And, you know, you don't have that representation from Mattapan, Roxbury, and maybe Dorchester that you do in this room. And so even in that context, you know, all parties involved needs to be pushed so we can have a more robust conversation to create um, these community benefits that truly will benefit all. So uh, I want to leave some time for audience questions. We could we could we could s explore this further. Um, uh, this has been a really good conversation. I just one last question for each of you. Um, make a wish. Um, sea level just a process rise. thing. I no, think like no, no, I think no. sea level make a rise. Process, which make a like a, something that would help unlock solutions, help us move towards solutions. A single thing you can you know, wa I, I wave I the magic wand and that, make it happen. Um, I think that they're being, s and I, that, this is a wish, but um, significant change as it relates to mm. uh, the ability of public sector funding from the federal government. Uh, specifically aimed at resiliency, there being some pool of funding that we feel like could provide that initial impetus to anchor some of these investments that then could attract the private sector and attract the philanthropy, but would be um, a bit of that uh, first mover. Mm. Um, that would be my wish. It could help leverage other resources, exactly. yep. So I have the privilege of being in multiple contexts and multiple spaces. And sometimes when I'm in the context of the private sector, they forget that or don't know that I'm also an elected official. And sometimes I hear things, I'm like, ouch, I think I'm offended by that. <laughs> and sometimes when I'm in the context of some of my um, public sector um, colleagues, you know, I hear things that I'm like, hmm, that may not go over very well in you know, a private sector context. And so it's given me um, really good insight as it relates to some of the things that needs to change in order for us to truly be able to move meaningful conversations forward. Um, if you approach a conversation automatically assuming that the person on the other side is the problem, then it's not going to get us very far. And I get that that's kind of the state of the world that we find ourselves in, particularly in the context of politics. And it's interesting. You, I see firsthand how that trickles down into like just basic decision making as it relates to having these diverse communities come together to figure out these major challenges and problems. So if I can wave my magic wand, I would I would push the private sector to appreciate a bit more the burden that falls on the public sector. And I would push the public sector to appreciate oh, two wishes. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll give you two. Appreciate the demands and the push that's um, happening on the private side. I'm, I'm still trying to think of my wish. So I, I don't know. I think really the story of East Boston is a model of how, I mean, you have a community there that has a lot of diversity. You have a lot of socioeconomic diversity. I think it's been a great model for other communities. Um, and I think I wish there was more communities where there are opportunities to do projects that engage the public and private sectors. Sammy. Okay, so questions from the audience. Is anyone still awake? Well, at least one person's nodding. Good, good. Yes, I'm Sasha from Metro Area Planning Council. Thank you. Um, and one of the things that came up was the idea around increased taxation or fees and how do we fund and finance projects. Um, but what I see that is really 
a question and sort of tension around who's bearing the costs and who's benefiting from the investments. And wondering if you could speak to the equity, sort of an equity lens on how we think about funding and financing. Um, well, I mean, I think that, you know, from purely as we think about fees or um, some sort of a tax, you would obviously want to think about um, the different nature of those and if it was, uh, you know, how regressive that was and, and the equity elements of that. I don't think that, you know, certainly from my perspective, there's not a, a proposal on the table of exactly how we would structure that, but it would be critically important. Um, I mean, I think that the, the perfect uh, type of a policy would be one that is truly thinking about how we are incrementally thinking about some sort of a tax or a fee that's directly tied to those who are benefiting from um, the protections put in place and the access um, that we that we have to enjoy those places on the waterfront. Um, there's a lot of different ways to structure that and there could be a lot of different proposals on the table, all of which I think should be discussed and the time is right to start to think about, think more broadly beyond just um, you know, traditional means of public-private partnerships to think about how we get some of the critical massing of financing that's needed. These are very expensive interventions that aren't going to be able to fully be paid for just through um, traditional community benefits from, from uh, private developers. So we're going to have to think a little bit more broadly in terms of what, what pools can we dip into. But I think your point is an excellent one in the sense that we have to make sure that it aligns with our overall aspirations as it relates to equity and truly providing um, uh, more equitable growth in our city and the region. Does it make sense, I, I, and, and I'm fascinated by all of your thoughts, and it's good to hear. Are we at a point in time now where we ought to be thinking about a different type of authority structure, which may, instead of being the Boston Authority, it may be the Massport Authority structure, which would cause the cities and towns which are engaged by the ocean in planning uh, for everything from sea level rise to all of the new type of shipping that's going to be going on and all the new type of wind power that's uh, going to be happening at a, at a minimum. Does it make sense to enjoin in this type of authority and, and really start to look at a more regional approach uh, to planning and the sharing of the economic burden as well as the, the benefit? It, by the way, this idea has been on people's minds since at least the 70s when I started. <laughs> And, and oh, by the way, with merit, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think Bob. it's a great idea. My only concern is that it adds yet another layer because I can't see the city getting, you know, doing away with its um, own requirements and its own protections, nor can I see the state. I mean, maybe if the state came up with... <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, I just think Could there's an urgency to this effort that needs to happen and and I'm afraid that people may not that creation of that may not uh, respect the urgency it may delay the process mm -hmm. I'm gonna say yes 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 and yes um, I've <laughs> I've lived in other want to think about that? <laughs> no yes 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 <laughs> I've lived in other places where there is regional collaboration I mean this is I it's interesting I I I've I feel like it's a privilege to live in the Northeast. You know, I love living particularly in the city of Cambridge. You twirl around twice, there's like five PhDs you're gonna knock into. And, and I appreciate that, that thought leadership that's all around us, but I also think that sometimes that gets in our own way. And there are other places that we can l look to to figure out how to figure out, you know, a, how do you find solutions from a regional perspective? But I know the way our government is set up, it's every city and town. And I think that we well, can push ourselves a little bit more to think outside that how we normally function right. I mean, to something bigger. So are there circumstances under which a, a regional, you know, another layer of government, if you want to think of it that way, are there conditions under which that could work and not engender the reaction that Abby had? I, in other words, is it not a yes or no question, but a how would you actually make that work question? I mean, I think that the key element, um, and, and to get to Abby's point, is is there a way that this is structured so that it actually streamlines and simplifies the right. process where already it's so layered with so many different um, regulatory bodies that are thinking about the waterfront. It Could this actually be a tool to streamline that and to um, move right. forward? Given the sense of urgency, is there a way to think about this? And I think that really is in structuring so that there's very specific focus on the mission of this authority, 
what is the mission, what is it trying to achieve, and how are we streamlining that, um, and what is the governance of that authority? Um, and uh, you know, I think that those are right. two critical elements um, that w that would be key to. The you have to make sure I that I just the first word of the legislation is notwithstanding. <laughs> well, I think that I think each city and town people have to be willing to give up some power at the end of the right. day and be able to trust whatever leadership that's put in place to be able to guide and set these regional policy goals that they know that is going to benefit the greater good and as a community as a region are we willing to have those types of conversations to be able to move this to move this forward and to, right. in order to achieve our goals. Right, right. So we're almost out of time here. Uh, I think we have room for maybe at most two more questions. Uh, so, uh, Julie Wormser, um, I want to ask what Bob and Nika said. It, it seems to me that we're in this conundrum where, particularly Massachusetts governance, um, is purposefully slow, right? On purpose. It's hard to do stuff because we don't want mob rule and we don't really like change, right? And yet that's incredibly maladaptive when you're dealing with uncertain <coughs> external environmental changes like climate change. And at the same time, we're learning from like Climate Ready Boston that the most useful interventions are at the neighborhood scale and at the regional scale where we have almost no governance. So um, I just want to put those conundrums on the table and say, how can we I guess just looking at Boston, how many in Cambridge, how many smart people there are, how much we want to do stuff, and in fact, how our governance system's in the way of making progress, and how could we um, get in a really move towards adaptive, efficient governance of of, uh, of change? Well, I think this was in thirty seconds sure. or less. Very quick. <laughs> I think this was brought up at the end of the last panel, but there's a you know how how long do we spend talking about maybe the specific nature of one element of one building, such as the height of one building, um, as opposed to um, actually thinking about the systems and networks that are so key to making this work. Um, and I think that does call for, you know, community engagement is incredibly important, but that community engagement needs to include um, enough voices uh, that are really thinking about this holistically from an overall mission standpoint, as well as the interests of those direct abutters. Um, and there's, there's going, the nature of, of change in our city is, it's complicated, um, and it's it's um, everyone brings their own uh, baggage to the table and their own interests to the table. But we need to think about if we have an overall higher level aspiration, how we make sure that's that's also a common thread throughout all of these conversations. Um, at one point, and I'm looking at Rob out there from Fort Point Associates, the city or the state was, I think, experimenting with this super MEPA process. Does anyone remember Super MEPA? So the MEPA process allows you to go through the state permitting. Um, you know, you go through all the different departments, but Super MEPA was going to let you go really quickly, but get everyone, you know, have a lot of meetings and get everyone involved. And it kind of, I don't know where it ever went. We went through it once and never saw it again. But it was an, oppor <laughs> it was an opportunity yeah. to maybe to start a down process, in that direction. Say it's going to be efficient yeah, and, and include it, all these. Right, with regional. the timekeeper's permission, I just wanted. W so, one, th one thing that strikes me here in this conversation is you, you said the word state. Why isn't the Commonwealth of Massachusetts the logical entity to be doing this? Uh, I, I understand that if you live in Beckett, maybe you don't think uh, the resilience of Boston Harbor is very important, but the reality is what is it? Uh, 35% of the population and 45% of the economic activity of the entire Commonwealth is, you know, uh, within a five mile radius of where we're sitting right now. Uh, is there a case to be made that the Commonwealth ought to be doing this? That the, f that, that, uh, the, the uh, you know, the, imp the, the stakes are high enough that we already have a level of government uh, that could be uh, active here or more active here. Maybe that's not, a, maybe that's a rhetorical question. Uh, <laughs> So one last, uh, time for one last question. Alice, forgive me, I know we're out of time, but I, w I promise two more questions, so. Uh, my name is Joel, I'm in Dorchester. Um, I had a question, I guess this is um, sort of like who is managing change on the waterfront. Um, so, and I, I want to frame this, so in one sense, Boston has sort of a, and I'm using Boston because I live here, um, Boston sort of has this renaissance of planning where the, the current administration has ushered in a lot of, of sort of macro and then 
uh, separate subject area plans that are coming together. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of input being generated. Um, I'm also thinking about the panel there, which is um, pri private sector and sort of quasi public. So my question, I guess, is sort of what level what level of, of wh where's the difference between sort of getting community input and and um, having public control or control by the community about the actual change that's being managed, right? So you could have private sector being enrolled, enlisted sort of as a funder and appreciating some benefit from that. You could have um, people in a neighborhood um, saying what they want, people in br broad of the neighborhood, maybe the whole city saying what they want of the harbor, and then you may have a another kind of agency like the, the um, BPDA or BRA that it operates a little bit in, uh, in between space, I think. Um, so the question is who's managing the change and where do you, where do you sort of draw a line between the um, generating ideas from a public planning process versus... Who's responsible for collecting all those ideas and then moving forward with a yeah, plan? And, and does the community just give ideas once or is it sort of some of the power is actually given there to an un unrolling plan? I mean, I think from, from our perspective, um, all the planning that we're doing, we view as being done in partnership with the community and it being an iterative process where there's multiple times and, and points in time for that conversation with the community. The highest level being Imagine Boston 2030 where it was really about broader value statements and then going to the more district level uh, scale of planning, which we're doing in collaboration with other city departments, truly public agencies, as well as in partnership with the community at the district, and then moving into the more specific parcel by parcel through Article 80 and through uh, the Chapter 91 process, which would then, those also layer on additional moments in time and, and opportunities for that uh, partnership and engagement with the community. So, uh, you know, I think that the, um, that management of change is a, um, is a, an ongoing dialogue that is going to go happen over um, a long period of time as you move forward from that broad level planning to a more specific concrete project, sometimes faster than others, but um, where you have, where you're iteratively having those conversations with the community where it's a, it's a public sector uh, conversation and private sector is coming, in, uh, coming to the table at various points in time and also a critical stakeholder. Um, you know, it, it, from our perspective at the, at the city level, I think that we feel um, that you know, the robust community dialogue at all portions of that planning process and then moving towards an actual entitlements of projects or actual implementation of an intervention um, is, is, you know, is, is key in the making sure that we have that partnership ongoing throughout the moments in time. I don't know if you know, from a private sector perspective or nonprofit, you guys have other elements of that. I, th I think when you start talking about community, um, I'm gonna go back to my elected official hat. I'm always I'm always um, cautious when I use that that term because a lot of times when we think about community, it's the people that show up at a meeting, quite frankly, and they shape the conversation. And you know, going back to this earlier conversation around a regional, you know, whether or not the answer is a regional, you know, type of system or governance to, to help with some of this. Um, you know, the complaints about heights and density and things of that nature, there's huge swaths of a community that can care less about that stuff. However, when we come together, those are the conversations that we're having. And I do not think that that's reflective of the community. Um, we had a panel recently through ULI um, where there was a local ED that worked with her community in conversation with um, Mass and Main project and the people that she worked with, they didn't care about that stuff. And so I think as it relates to how we structure community feedback in the context of a waterfront or development in general, it's some type of way cities um, and people that are professionals like ourselves just have to be very intentional around how do we define the term community to make sure we're getting a broad perspective on what will shape a project moving forward. And I do think that there are opportunities for um, specific agencies, whether that's the state or regionally, to figure out to go deeper into some of these challenges. Just to layer on one more thing to that point, which I think is really key, I, I think there's an opportunity to have a broader conversation on public purpose and and the overall um, the overall public interest that's being served that moves beyond the hyper local level that might often come out to the meetings and thinks more broadly about the the city and the region. And I think that that's an important element of this conversation. It has to move beyond that hyper local to also thinking about those broader public benefits to the city and region at large. And and I think it, that's the that's also where there's a role for um, both 
leaders in this room, um, public sector officials at the, at the city and state level to all um, be voicing what the overall aspirations are and what we're working towards. Great. Thanks. Thank you to our panel for a rich conversation.